Hey, I'm Sarah with iHeartRadio, catching up with Taylor Mumson from The Pretty Reckless. How are you doing? I'm very good. How are you? I'm great. Uh, from my understanding, you're taking a brief break from rehearsal to come chat with us right now? Yeah, just a, a quick little hey. We're, uh, we are in pre-production rehearsals right now, and it's going awesome, and we can't can't wait to actually do this in front of people. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Well, you just celebrated the one-year anniversary of Death by Rock and Roll, which went to number one during the pandemic. Yes. So that meant you couldn't perform it live. I have to ask over a year later, have you had the chance to get out in front of a live audience and play some of those songs? Uh, not yet. <laughs> it's crazy enough. Um, yeah, it's, our first show is going to be on April 1st, um, which is, I think it's our first show in almost five years, which is insane when you think about that. Uh, we're just, we're so excited. I mean, we've been rehearsing for like six months and, you know, just playing to ourselves going one day, there'll be people one day. Um, it's, it's fantastic though. It's so much fun. We got a lot of new material. Um, and I think it's going to be really cool because, you know, normally when you put out an album, you immediately go on tour with it, which is, you know, what we would have done had there not been a pandemic. But, uh, so you're always kind of introducing the audience to the new stuff, uh, live. Whereas in this case, now that it's been out for a year, hypothetically, the audience is going to know it all already. So it'll be this kind of new experience. This is going to be really awesome. What are the emotions like during rehearsals? Because I can only imagine for such a deeply personal album, you know, it's, uh, there must be a lot of just excitement to get out there. A lot of excitement. I think the, you know, the emotional side of the record, that's, that comes in the recording of it and the writing of it. And then when you get to kind of the live stage of things, it's more about the performance and the energy and, you know, live music is fun like it's so much fun so even if you're singing very kind of heavy personal lyrics the the overall energy of the whole thing is just you know awesome <laughs> it's just awesome so we're, we're just so so excited we can't wait to play these songs for people yeah I can imagine you know while we're talking about the emotion of the album it really is so emotionally vulnerable I've heard you talk about how deeply personal it is to you, um, if you listen front to back, there's a line in Rock and Roll Heaven, when you sing I'll Survive, I was just covered in chills, like, oh, and I have, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when you're writing, do you ever have these moments where you're like, that's, that's a little too personal, I'm going to hold this to myself, or at this point, are you like, here, I'm putting it all in, on the table? No, I, th I think, I think you can't put boundaries on yourself as a writer. I think that, I think that that's a disservice to you. Um, so I, I really try not to. I think that there's certainly moments where when writing or when recording, I go, this is really, all right, I'm really doing this, aren't I? <laughs> you know, like it, it hits you, but it doesn't, it never makes me second guess that. I think that that's what makes music, you know, that's a, a huge part of what connects music to people is, that, is there's a humanity to it and an honesty to it that you can't, you can't, avoid like you you have to you have to go there to to get you what you're trying to say across you know was it always like that or did you have a freeing moment in your songwriting career where you're like you know what I'm just gonna start writing exactly what I want to put out there it was always like that and that's why I mean that's I think that's why I love writing songs so much it's where it's where it stemmed from in the beginning for me is I, I wrote music because it was the one place that I could really be myself and I could really express who I was and what I was feeling and what I was thinking and without any judgment or outside um, perspectives or opinions, you know, coming to my way. It was just, it was simply for me and it was my outlet of how to keep myself sane and it still is. And so, so it's, it's, it's the best gift to, to be able to, to write and express yourself like that. It's just, it's incredible. Now, aside from the album going to number one, you also celebrated, I have to say congratulations because the Pretty Reckless became the first female fronted act with seven number one uh, singles on the Billboard rock charts. Now, 10 years together, about 10 years together, right? Um, what does that feel like looking back on that and now celebrating, you know, seven number ones? It feels surreal. Um, I mean, like to even say it out loud sounds crazy. It's like, well, that can't be right, uh, but it is. And so it's just, it's incredibly humbling and rewarding and amazing. I mean, like it's just, there's no, the other way to describe it then we're just we're so flattered and so thankful that there's people out there that care and listen to what I have to say and, and you know it's it's absolutely amazing you know and we're, we're celebrating uh women's history month and I've heard you speak about terms such as female fronted band female led rock band and how they're not the greatest because they can create this subdivision of rock whereas it should just be good music you know good rock music it's good or bad and I'm wondering what do you think we can do to enhance the normalization of that exact thing 
Oh man, that's a good question. I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the way I approach everything is I just kind of go, there shouldn't be a divide. I mean, there, there is obviously that exists. And so I just kind of tend to ignore it and just put my best foot forward always, or at least try to, and just, you know, work on myself. And I think that that's the best advice you can give to any artist, you know, male or female. It's like, if you internalize and you, and you focus your energies on you and, and being the best, being better than you were before and constantly moving forward, then you're going to eventually get to a place where you're in, you know, hopefully um, <laughs> here where you're, you're competing with the people you want to be competing with. And you're not stuck in a kind of a, a, a niche sub genre or whatever you want to call it, you know, cause I look at music and I go, no, I want to compete with the best of them and not just the other women, you know? Um, and so I just kind of try to focus on, on that, I guess. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll get to that, you know, it won't be a divide at some point. It'll just be the best songs, the best song, the best bands, are the best band. And it has nothing to do with your gender. Yeah. I love that. Have you felt any kind of shift in that atmosphere in your experience? I mean, I think that we've been around now for a while, and I think that we've certainly felt um, a shift in acceptance, uh, you know, from other bands and from the industry and and things like that. Where I think in the beginning it was kind of an uphill battle for for me at least to kind of pr- I, I, people had a lot of preconceived notions about me. I guess <laughs> is the, the right way to say it. And I think that you know it's taken time to kind of prove that this is a real thing and a real band and and you know not some sort of uh fling or whatever um and so I think that that's been really amazing but you know but also you know I don't want to shun the women thing too because I just I don't like that it's so focused on it all the time but at the same time it's when we started there weren't a lot of female fronted rock bands um and you're seeing way more of that now which I think is awesome like you know I never want to say that I'm like a role model or anything I always get asked that and I'm like I don't I don't want that pressure but it is cool to see that I've been you know I hopefully I think I've inspired some other girls and women to pick up instruments and start you know writing songs and playing in a band and listening to great rock and roll records and I think that that's awesome if I can share that with anyone then I'm doing something right (laughs) heck yeah you know it's funny you mentioned pressure because hearing you speak about that it made me think of a conversation that I've had with uh, people close to me, especially in the past couple of years in the pandemic about how, you know, you get called strong. And yes, thank you for calling me strong, but also don't because then on days where I need a hug, I feel like I need to suppress that. And uh, similarly, I'm wondering if using terms like female led band and, and really leaning into that puts this, you know, added pressure of being great for all women. No, because I don't think of it like that. I really don't. I, I, I think the, the added pressure comes from myself of just being great. So that's not for yeah. women or about women or anything like that. It's like, I think my pressure is actually higher. If it was just for women, I think it would be easier. You know what I mean? Like it said, it's no, it's everyone. It's everyone. So it's, you know, double the amount of people. You have to be great. So when you were getting started, did you have any mentors that you could lean on? No, I, don't, I wouldn't want to say mentors. That's the wrong term. But I, I certainly had um, people in my life, musical compatriots and, and such that, that were always there for me and um and, and really it's the band and, and Cato was was my my rock um so obviously it was very diff- I, we'll move on from, <laughs> from that it was very difficult to you know lose him because he was so uh integral in in not only my career and, and such but my life and he's my best friend who I talked to you know minutely about everything and so it was very losing him was very hard but it did bird this album so it's it's a it's always bittersweet, I guess. I don't know. I, I said that badly, I think. <laughs> but yes, yeah. I've, had, I've had people in a, in a great support system, musically and personally, that um, helped me. And now you're you're putting that album into rehearsal, like we mentioned off the top. You're you're uh, getting ready for this tour. What are you know? The first concert I went back to after the pandemic, I was so ill prepared. My body was not adjusted, and I immediately lost my voice. Uh, but you have an untouched wrath my goodness, what are you doing to warm up and protect your vocal cords? Nothing. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, I don't, I, to me, warming up is just singing songs. Uh, like, I don't do any kind of vocal exercises or anything like that. I just just sing, you know, maybe start with some simpler, easier songs to warm up your voice, but uh, that's that's how I do it. So hopefully that uh, nothing's changed over time and that holds up this time around, but uh, it's been working for me so far. So <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, seriously, fingers crossed. Taylor Momsen, it was such a pleasure catching up with you. Best of luck with the the rest of rehearsals, but 
best of luck on tour. Have a great time. Thank you so much. We can't wait. And we're going to be in Canada too. I didn't, we didn't mention that. So we're coming in August with Greta Van Fleet. I'm so excited. It's going to be amazing. And uh, get your tickets and all that jazz. We can't wait to see you guys.